Is there? Another one? Marvellous. On screen. Hello, it's slowing. No, Billy, no! No, Billy, no! Billy, Billy, Billy! Hey Arfon, Jonathan Knight here. I run a YouTube channel called B-Movie Madness in which I review B-movies of various kinds, especially shot and video stuff. Um, at the end of your Spookies tribute video, you mentioned that you welcome recommendations. And I was thinking, because I'll be reviewing it for my channel, how about a tribute to the 1974 classic Black Christmas? Ooh, that'd be a good one. Can't wait to see your work. Merry Christmas. Hello, welcome back to Vidorama, where we remember the VHS releases of the past in graphic detail. My name's Arvon Jones. I'm an artist, and each month on this channel I paint a tribute to a movie that we rented on video back in the day. It's Christmas, so we are celebrating Black Christmas, released in 1974. It was produced and directed by Bob Clark, and it starred Olivia Hussey, Margot Kidder, and John Saxon. Black Christmas is a genuinely creepy horror film and it continues to divide horror fans to this day. Some say it's the first slasher, others say it's not. I don't think it is, but we all agree that it is a classic and it set the blueprints for every other slasher movie released after 1974. So, put an extra log on the fire, get yourself some eggnog, roast some chestnuts, sit back, relax and watch me paint a tribute to Black Christmas. Here we go. The colours I'm using are titanium white, Mars black, cadmium red and lime yellow. As you saw, I prepared the drawing beforehand and then once I'm happy with it, I photocopy the drawing onto thin card for painting. Detail is then reapplied and then some with my pens. Okay, Black Christmas. The story takes place in a sorority house in December as they're preparing for a Christmas break. The girls keep receiving strange phone calls. An intruder climbs into the house and hides in the attic and shortly after one of the girls goes missing. While her concerned father and friends look for her, the police become involved and they try and make sense of the situation and try to figure out who keeps making the strange phone calls to the house. Now with the background colour added, I'm adding a stencil to protect the paint. Now in the movie we don't actually see the killer that clearly. And rather than just having him feature as a predominantly black silhouette, I thought I would try something similar to what I did last month in the Spookies painting, where I will take a regular sponge and I will add some white paint to it, just getting the majority of the paint on, just so it's like a light coating. And I will dab the paint on, creating a stipple effect. You know, as if um, somebody wiped the window and it just happens to look like the shape of Billy. I don't know, we'll see how it works. I got this idea from the stencils we used to have as children, where we used to spray fake snow on the window and create a Christmassy scene. I'm quite happy with how that turned out. What do you think? I'll do it again in smaller scale for the other window. This movie was made in Canada during a glorious era in Canadian cinema known as the Tax Shelter Era. This was when the government allowed movie investors to deduct 100% of their investments in Canadian movies from their taxable income, and this resulted in a dramatic increase in Canadian films being produced each year. If your movie featured a predominantly Canadian cast and crew, it qualified as a tax shelter movie, and so many exploited this loophole which not only helped launch the career of David Cronenberg uh, with such movies as Shivers, Rabbit, The Brood and Scanners, but it also marked the golden age of the slasher era because Canada was either producing them in the guise of Prom Night, Terror Train, Happy Birthday to Me and My Bloody Valentine, or they were inspiring other countries to make their own. One director that greatly benefited from the tax shelter era was Bob Clark, who had already directed Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, released in 1972, before going to Canada to finish post-production work on his next movie, Death Dream. He fell in love with Toronto and he moved there, and then he was offered a screenplay called Stop Me, written by Canadian screenwriter Roy Moore. 
more base the story on both the babysitter and the man upstairs urban legend and the crimes of Wayne Bowden, the Canadian serial killer nicknamed the Vampire Rapist who killed four women between 1969 and 1971. Now I'm not sure if this is going to work, but I think I might try some red and green for John Saxon. Just to sort of highlight those Christmas colours. I don't know, we'll try it. John Saxon. Why has it taken me this long to feature a movie starring John Saxon? Saxon played Lieutenant Fuller. Just how many policemen did Saxon actually play in his career? But he wasn't the first choice for this one. It was originally offered to Academy Award winner Edmund O'Brien. No, I'm not happy with that. I'm not feeling it. I think we'll stick with the green. But yeah, Edmund O'Brien had accepted the role of Fuller and he flew out to Toronto two days before filming. However, the producers soon realised that O'Brien was actually suffering from Alzheimer's and incapable of performing. Sadly, they had to let him go and this left them with no one in the role of Fuller. Facing possible cancellation of the project, they contacted John Saxon, who thankfully agreed. He flew out to Toronto, and within two hours of stepping off the plane, he was in costume and out on location, filming his first scene. Saxon had been impressed by the script of Black Christmas, which had been altered quite a bit by Clark, who had been given full creative artistic control of the project. The script was altered to make the characters relatable, and changed from babysitters to students. The film mostly takes place at college locations. Uh, some scenes were actually shot outside the University of Toronto. Humour was also added in the guise of Margot Kidder's character Barb and Mrs Mack, the house mother played by Marion Waldman. The role of Mrs Mack was actually based on an aunt that Clark had that would hide alcohol around the house. The role was first offered to Betty Davis who turned it down. The other alteration to the script was that we never get to know the identity of the killer, or are we given a defined backstory, adding further unease. The movie has an impressive cast. Uh, playing the role of Jess, we have Olivia Hussey, which frustratingly seems absent whenever I hear people discussing strong female leads in horror. The character breaks one of the fundamental rules of being a final girl when you think about it. Olivia Hussey had achieved worldwide acclaim for her portrayal as Juliet in Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet in 1968 before starring in Black Christmas. The story goes that she agreed to do the movie after visiting a psychic who told her that she would be making a movie in Canada and that it would make a lot of money. Hussey would later play Mary in Jesus of Nazareth, and then Mother Teresa, but she also played Norma Bates in the often overlooked Psycho 4, which I've always rather liked. And she was of course in the 1990 miniseries adaptation of It, and later Ice Cream Man with Clint Howard in 1995. Another great character is of course Barb, played by Canadian-born Margot Kidder, who accepted the role because she could see similarities between herself and the character. She adds both humour and sadness to the movie. Despite being known to millions throughout the world as Lois Lane, uh, myself included, uh, for me she is Lois Lane, uh, she also appeared in other horror movies, uh, the Amityville Horror in 1979 of course, and she was also in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 in 2009. Oh and she was in an episode of Tales from the Crypt. The Lady in the Window was Lynn Griffin. Uh, she would go on to star in another Canadian slasher film after this, Curtains, released in 1983. Including her death in this painting isn't really a spoiler, it's one of the more iconic images of the movie. It even made the movie's poster. The movie also featured Andrea Martin in the role of Phil, a role that was originally given to Gilda Radner, but she backed out of the project a month before filming to join the cast of Saturday Night Live. Martin had starred in Cannibal Girls the previous year, and after Black Christmas she would join the cast of the television series SCTV. She was also Wanda the Word Fairy on Sesame Street and provided a voice to a ton of cartoon shows. I can't list them all, but if you watched cartoons during the 90s and 2000s, you will have heard her voice. Uh, she was in Darkwing Duck, Goof Troop, Real Monsters, Rugrats, Batman the Animated Series, Jimmy Neutron, 
She was Apu's mother in The Simpsons. She was also Queen Slug for a butt in the Earthworm Jim series. I thought it was important to feature the house in this painting as it's a character in its own right. The film's antagonist Billy was played by several people in this film, namely Nick Mancuso. Mancuso would apply pressure to his thorax to achieve that voice. And apparently he would stand on his head during recording. Clark also provided some of the voices and screams that we hear on the phone. Billy's hands and arms that we see in the POV shots belong to the camera operator Bert Dunk, who made a harness that allowed him to mount the camera on his shoulder so he could use both hands to climb the trellis in that iconic shot at the start of the film. Aside from being creepy, the film also feels very cold. It was filmed during winter in Toronto and you can actually see the actor's breath. Apparently they didn't always have real snow. In some cases they had to create their own snow courtesy of a fire truck that would spray foam everywhere. And they were warned not to get any on the house as it was difficult to remove after. For such a cold movie we're going to need some more snow. So let's add it to the trees. No particular way of doing it, just adding it to one side. But the cold wind brought the snow in from this direction. Having been one of the highest grossing movies in Canada, the movie went over to America and was distributed by Warner Brothers, who had an issue with the title. They thought it would be mistaken for a black exploitation movie and so the title was changed to Silent Night, Evil Night. They even pushed for a different ending, but Clark refused. Thankfully, they gave it back its original title, but it didn't quite receive the recognition it deserved. It's important to not overlook the impact this movie would have on horror movies in the future. A few years later, Clark was working with John Carpenter, and apparently Carpenter asked him if there was ever going to be a sequel to Black Christmas. Being a wintry scene, we're going to need snow, and that's where these pens come into the row. Let's add some snowflakes. Going back to the Clark and Carpenter story, when asked if he was going to make a sequel, he said that he had no desire to direct another horror movie. But when Carpenter pushed him and asked him if he were to make a sequel, what would it be like? Clark said that the killer would have been caught, institutionalized, and he would then escape, stalk and kill young women. And all this would take place on Halloween night. Go to sleep and dream of snow 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 Clark had a mixed and varied career. He went on to write and direct another genre-defining movie, Porky's, which was released in 1981, which launched the teen sex comedy format before he returned to the subject of Christmas in 1983 with A Christmas Story, considered by many to be one of the best Christmas films ever made. In later years, he was serving as co-producer on a remake of Black Christmas and preparing for a remake of Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things when he and his youngest son were tragically killed in a car crash caused by a drunk driver on April 4th, 2007. His importance to cinema, Canadian or otherwise, should not be downplayed. I trust that you will follow the example of Elvis Presley and myself and watch Black Christmas every Christmas. Thank you for joining me today and keeping me company. As ever, I hope that was of interest to you and you approve of the final painting. If so, perhaps you'll let me know what you think of the comments and uh, give this video a thumbs up, seeing as it is the season of giving. Thank you to Jonathan for recommending this movie. Be sure to check out his B Movie Madness channel. There's a link for it in the description, as is the links to the social networking sites, the Etsy store and the Patreon page. I would like to thank my supporters for their kindness this past year, be it through Patreon or for buying prints or commissioning work. And I would also like to thank everybody that has supported the channel, be it through subscribing, commenting, liking and sharing my videos. I love every one of you. Rest assured, there are many more painting tributes to come in 2022, but until then, I would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas out there, whatever you are. <laughs>